For Civilization V, one of our major goals was to create a really beautiful, inviting, and organic world because we wanted players to feel like, as they were creating the history of this world, they had a world that they were invested in. This is the America's tile set you're seeing here. We have ones for Europe, Africa, and Asia as well. And the reason to have four different continent types is that as players are exploring the world, each new geographic region they come to has its own unique look. Again, this is about creating a plausible world for players to explore. And one of the reasons we're able to get this really great organic looking terrain was one of the gameplay innovations in Civilization V, and that was the switch from square tiles to hexagons. Hexagons are cool because they give us a lot of really great gameplay mechanics, especially in terms of movement. Movement over long distance equalizes a lot better with hexagons than it does with squares. With squares, there are always cheats on the corners. These also reduce some of the ambiguity in the terrain. For example, you can have some weird artifacts when square tiles meet at corners, and you don't get that with hexagons. We know that players want a lot of information when they're playing a game of Civilization. Information about what they're seeing on the screen, the units they're controlling, things like that. And Civilization Revolution, which was our Civilization experience for the consoles, taught us a lot about how to present this complex information to players, but do it in a way that they could control it with a gamepad. We use those design lessons in Civilization V to push the user interface out to the margins of the screen and keep players invested in the world. For example, we do things with unit functions so that functions that players typically need, like move and attack, are always visible, and secondary functions like delete the unit are behind the fold. Not only does this clean up some of the clutter, but it keeps people from accidentally deleting their units. For this demo, we're going to be playing as the Roman Empire. We've been playing for a little while and our civilization has expanded quite a bit. We have a few cities at this point. We have some tile improvements, such as this plantation for silks, as well as farms for growth, camps for furs. We've even got a mine for gems. But we're really interested in the city screen for Rome. So let's go into the city of Rome real quick. This is the city screen for Civilization V. On the upper left, you can see your population and your next growth, as well as how much research, gold, and culture your city is producing. Down in the lower left, you can see what your city is currently producing. And right now, we're building a lighthouse in Rome. Over on the right hand of the screen are the buildings and wonders that have already been created for the city. This is also where you find manual specialist control. We found that civilization players often choose to have their cities specialize in something, such as culture, or science, or production. And if you want to set a specialization here, the game will find the optimal set of tiles to work with your workers so that you're getting the most of that stuff from this city. But if you're the kind of player who prefers to set which tile your workers are working on, you have that ability as well. Again, this is about using the user interface to streamline aspects of the game, but still give players the ability to manage some of the fine details. As with previous civilization games, culture will continue to expand the borders of your civilization but now you'll do it one tile at a time towards resources that are important for your current focus. You can also use gold to accelerate this process. We're going to buy two tiles here, and when we return to the map, you can see that these have been added to our empire. This can be a valuable strategy for growth. You can send a settler out near some valuable resources, and then use your treasury to buy up the land near your new city. Culture is also the currency for the social policy system, and this is a major new part of Civilization V. Social policies improve specific aspects of your civilization. For instance, here we have the aristocracy social policy, and that improves our ability to create wonders. These social policies are also keyed into the cultural victory of the game. If you complete five of these social policy trees, you unlock the Utopia Project, which is a world wonder. And if you're the first civilization to complete this wonder, you'll have won a cultural victory. Let's look a little bit at diplomacy in Civilization V, and we'll do this by sending a musketman to the south to meet a new civilization. The leaders in Civilization V are these fully realized characters in an environment speaking to you in their native language, and we wanted you to feel like you were interacting with a worthy adversary and somebody who is taking you seriously as a major leader of the world. The scene that you're meeting this character in also tells you something about their personality. Here we're meeting Napoleon on the battlefield, but you might also meet Washington in his study, or Gandhi by the side of the ocean. The leaders don't just look cool in these diplomatic scenes. We've made changes to the artificial intelligence so that the leaders play a lot more like an experienced civilization player does. 
Each civilization has a flavor or things that it does particularly well, and each leader has a preferred path to victory. So Napoleon, for instance, might try to build a huge land army and take over the world that way. But the AI is clever enough that if you're thwarting it, for example, you're the better general and you keep beating Napoleon on the battlefield, it'll try to find a new way to win the game. For example, Napoleon might try to pour his civilization's energy into unlocking the glories of France instead. City-states are another new addition for Civilization V. These are small, single-city civilizations that aren't out to win the game, so they give you a chance to have some peaceful diplomatic action with somebody who isn't going to be your competitor at the end of the game. Befriending a civilization can have some powerful advantages as well, too. Let's go ahead and meet Geneva. We see they're a cultured city-state, and they have an irrational personality, so they're always going to be presenting us with interesting challenges. We're interested in earning their friendship, so we're going to go ahead and give them a gift of gold. Now, when we return to the main screen, you'll see we get a notification that says we're friends with them. As we maintain this relationship over time, not only will we get the advantage of the culture from Geneva, but after the United Nations is built, there'll be a series of elections and we know we can count on their votes towards winning a diplomatic victory. But now that we've invested in friendship with Geneva, we have to decide how much we're willing to commit to protect Geneva. If Geneva is attacked by England, do we help protect Geneva? Maybe we can't risk war with England, and so Geneva might fall and we would lose the time and resources we've invested in them. The city-states cause a lot of gameplay to occur just by being something in the world that the other major civilizations can befriend or besiege, and they provide a lot of depth to the diplomatic game in Civilization V. But let's look at this English city of Newcastle for a second here. We want this city. We want it badly. It has farmland that would really help our civilization grow, and it has the Stonehenge world wonder. Uh, we think we would be better rulers of this city, and we've built an army to the purpose of bringing it into our civilization. But uh, Romans are a fair and peaceful people, so we'll give diplomacy one last chance. Hello again. When you bring up the trade menu in the diplomatic screen, you'll see options okay. that might be familiar from previous versions of Civ. You can ask for a tribute of gold or defensive pact, but the research agreement is new for Civilization V. Both civilizations lay out a sum of money and get a boost to their research for a fixed number of turns. But what we really want is the city of Newcastle, and so we're willing to pay the princely sum of two pieces of gold for it. Let's see if Elizabeth takes up our offer. I beg your pardon? Well, it's a shame that she declined, because by doing this, she's just brought war on herself. Combat is an area of the game that's seen a significant change in Civilization V. We're bringing real tactical combat to Civilization with the introduction of one unit per tile. In previous versions of Civilization, you could put any number of military units into any tile on the board, and you could sort of ship these at an enemy city, and this was what our fans affectionately referred to as the Stack of Doom. Now you'll need to think very carefully about what units you're building and how you're deploying them in the environment. For example, here we have a rifleman facing off against Elizabeth's rifleman, but we're attacking across a river against troops on higher ground, supported by their friends, and we would really take it badly if we attack now. What we can do is soften up that unit a bit by firing on it with a ranged unit. Ranged units are another important part of the strategy in Civilization V. Ranged units can attack over frontline units and sort of prepare them for an attack. Since we've done that with our cannon, we can move into attack. Now that we've attacked with our riflemen, we can see if we can finish them off with our cavalry. Elizabeth used one rifleman on a good, solid piece of terrain and held off against almost three separate attacks, badly mauling two of our units in the process. In Civilization V, you can hold key points in the terrain, like a mountain pass, and use these units to hold off against a civilization with better production capability, and it feels pretty awesome when you do that. Let's go ahead and push our attack. We've caught one of Elizabeth's cannons out in the open away from her front line. Let's send a cavalry unit in to ambush them. Range units are strong, but they're not invincible. You'll want to protect your range units with a good solid front line of defenders. Because Elizabeth made good use of the units that she had on the terrain, she was able to break up our advance on Newcastle. We would have to heal up a bit before we could push on to Newcastle itself, 
and by then she might have brought up reinforcements. So, for right now, we're going to shift to another location where the odds are much better in our favor. In this situation, the odds go much better for us. Gloucester's lightly defended with only one unit at the sea and one on land. So we'll look at how cities defend themselves in Civilization V. Each city has a fixed number of hit points, and you'll need to bring these to zero before you can march in and occupy the city. Our frigates have done a pretty good job of battering Gloucester's defenses, but we still need to occupy it from land. So let's send in our armies to attack. We've taken Gloucester. We have some choices here. We can burn the city to the ground and salt the earth by raising it, or we can bring it into our empire. But if we do, we'll take a penalty of unhappiness as our new subjects adjust to life as Romans. Or we have the option to turn it into a puppet. Puppet City will produce the gold, science, and culture as normal, but we don't have the option to choose what's built there. However, we will take less unhappiness for doing this. We're going to jump forward in time to almost the end of the game. Here we've been fighting Montezuma, and we just took one of his cities. But as we did that, we noticed he was sneaking north with a component to the spaceship that you build for the space race victory. If he gets this to his capital, he can assemble that and the rest of the spaceship components that launch them and win the game. And this isn't acceptable to us. We want to win the game. We're the Romans. The glory of the world belongs to us. Probably the best solution at this point would be to go ahead and occupy his city. Unfortunately for us, the middle of his empire is a bit of an unknown quantity, so let's send in a helicopter gunship to scout out the situation. Oh, we see that he has entrenched surface-to-air missile launchers, anti-tank guns, mechanized infantry units all on solid ground. We could attack with our armored units, but it would take us a long time to break through there, and by then he might have assembled his ship and launched it, and we would have lost the game. Well, fortunately, as all Civilization players know, there's always one high explosive option open to you. Now we've done it. There's fallout blanketing the earth, and we've probably blown up our chances for a diplomatic victory as well. We'll have to satisfy ourselves with taking a city by conquest instead. Now we've taken Montezuma's capital. We've taken our first capital in the game. If we take all of the enemy capitals, we'll have won a conquest victory. So, from here we have some choices. We can go back to England and we can keep pushing onward, and this time we're not going to settle for Newcastle. We want nothing less than London itself. And from there we're going to build the largest army that's ever been seen in the world, and we're going to push on to the gates of Paris itself and fight Napoleon. And then you can look up and it's 3 o'clock in the morning. This is Civilization V, and we're really excited about bringing it out this September.